This is Woods from Arm and Hammer, and you're listening to the Cabbages Hip Hop Podcast. Hey, this is Blockhead, and you're listening to the Cabbages Hip Hop Podcast. sure we'll get into the inconsistencies i'm sure we'll get into the, the weird nature of this film that's odd i'm sure of it but there's something that's been burning me since we watched it oh what's up with these cranes i love cranes first and foremost but these cranes are killing people in the movie and these journalists are like eh, death sells guys what why why would you not pursue the crane story i hate cranes Hmm. Hmm. so that's street street smart (laughs) that's street Street smart smart. 1987 that (laughs) passes for discourse essentially that's pretty Um, much it if you haven't watched street smart which is the movie pick for our third ever cabbages all-stars you probably want to watch it before you dive into this episode probably it's not a recommendation i want to be disturbing not an endorsement that we're doing here it's just that you're going to have to understand that we are still unsure of what we watched and we are about to have a discussion about it. Right. And I watched it two and a half times. So I just want you as the listeners, just to be prepared. If you come into this, it might just feel confusing to you, but understand that it's because it's confusing to us now in this moment, as we are to discuss this. Gary, you could call me the sickness because I'm disturbed. Well put. So I'm wearing my fancy movie hat, my brown bunny movie hat. Mm. Shout out to Vincent Gallo. This is mm. not authorized merch, by the way. This is <laughs> business. Uh, he'd be real mad. But we figured we do things a little bit differently on this episode. This movie got mm. picked, and we'll talk about that. It was picked as by Blockhead and myself for this and we'll go into the details but we needed to have two outstanding artists and guests on this episode to see out this third and for the time being final uh episode of cabbages cabbages Cabbages, all-stars baby cabbages all-stars uh before we move into our new year with all sorts of fun stuff planned more rapper and so we managed to get Billy Woods and, as I said before, Blockhead to excited. come on. I'm so excited. This. You know, if you, like me, are a fan of Dower Candy, you know that these guys have made some incredible music together. They continue to make great music together on their projects. But unfortunately, this is not a podcast about music. This is a podcast not. about movies. It's and about 1987 Street Smart. So sit back, relax, and prepare to be as confused as we are. introduce our guest for today's show first up we have billy woods of backwood studios fame he's dropped two incredible albums this year maps with producer kenny siegel and the arm and hammer full length we buy diabetic test strips also joining us today is blockhead a new york native and veteran producer he recently released his excellent new album the ox via backwood studios with features by asap rock danny brown Fatboy sharif and many more they've both been on the pod before albeit separately, and we are overjoyed to welcome them back in duo mode as Cabbage's All-Stars. Hello, gentlemen, and welcome to the show. What's, up? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, It is, it is a, a wild shock to me that after what we put you two through, you'd be willing to come back and, and be put through another ringer like this. This is wild to me, and I really appreciate it. 
We thank this you. This is a totally different, totally different situation. I was curious how uh, how this one was selected out of them. And a surprising fact about this movie is uh, apparently Morgan Freeman was nominated for an Oscar. He sure was. And yeah. the crazy thing is that um, I watched this movie and towards the end, I was like, dude is doing a really good job even though I have several questions about the purpose of the job he was oh, doing. Um, yes. He was acting. Yeah. Well, he was incredible in this film. He acted his ass off. He acted his ass off. It's nice to see him in a different light, you know? Mm. It's a, it's a yeah. pleasant pleasant change of pace for him. Yeah. Well, let's just start with just the, because um, that, that fun fact is definitely something that will we'll get brought up in this because it's an interesting uh, thing about where Morgan Freeman's career went after this film. But the key thing is that we in this all-star season have sort of been uh, less rigid about how we pick the films. And mm. ultimately, uh, we did an episode uh, with Fat Tony and Fatboy Sharif, and Fatboy Sharif uh, picked the movie himself. He picked Kids in the Hall Brain Candy. That one's out now. Everyone can listen to that. I put together a short list of films, about five films, I think, and I presented them one morning to Blockhead and said, choose from it. And there were some definitely some landmines on that list. The Adventures of Pluto Nash was on that list. Yeah. Uh, and you chose poorly. We could have been talking about Pluto Nash, dog. I, I've seen it already. <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm good. I don't need to see it again. I'm good. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't even know what that movie is. Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy with um Eddie Murphy. it was a huge bomb. Joe Pantoliano is that and um oh uh Randy Quaid. Randy Quaid is in it as a as a robot. Wow. Oh, Randy, yeah. Randy Quaid. It's a Eddie Murphy interspace. Movie. Oh, and uh Rosario Dawson is in it too. I mean, it's a it's an A-list cast to be sure in a solid C movie. Was this actually the first Men in Black movie? Did we did I miss one? Uh, no, it's it's beyond Men in Black. This is okay, like space. This is space. This is like Whoa. Flash Gordon. Yeah, it's, right, it's right. um it's a doozy. They were trying but, to do something. So ultimately, what ended up happening was Blockhead shows something I put on this list out of curiosity because I've been seeing a lot about it, and that's Street Smart. The only criteria I really put together of that list of movies for for you, Blockhead, was that they were on Tubi and they were <laughs> around ninety minutes. That was the main I criteria. Love this podcast. Yeah. Around 90 minutes. <laughs> to on to be. That's it. That's how I chose it. So to answer uh-huh. your question, Woods, that's how we got there. Okay. So this for is partially my part. fault. If you'd seen their list, you'd know. Okay. Okay. Just 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 for the record, I also want to note that you 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 guys ducked the caveman's Valentine again. Oh. Uh, I, mean, I was look. all in. <laughs> I was all in. A mistake, personally. I think I think that was a mistake. But the flip side was uh, this was not like the other movies. No, like, no. It's definitely it's like a not real movie, a movie uh, at all. But it's a serious movie that is taking itself seriously, even mm. when it shouldn't be. And um, and yeah, a couple people are actually really trying. And have some talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of them, in my estimation, is not Christopher Reeve. <laughs> <laughs> he's, the, he's the Chris Klein before Chris Klein. In this right. Wow. He just sort of walks into every scene like, man, this is weird. You guys are weird. I never realized how big he was. He's a giant. He's a real big dude. He's a real big dude. I go, he's, he's, six four. Superman. I he's Superman. He's yeah. Superman. He... Fun fact, he got this made. This is a passion project for him. Yep. He wanted to get this made. And he signed up to do Superman 4 in as penance to do well, this movie. Wow. Basically, he'd been wanting to do this movie for years. He'd been wanting to do yeah. this one for years. And there were new producers who bought the rights to Superman uh, for film who were had nothing to do with the first three Superman movies. Right. So they bought these rights and they wanted this movie. And so they basically said, this is Canon Films, the producers behind Canon Films. And they were basically saying that we'll finance your pet project if you come on 
and do Superman four with us. And they gave him like story credit on Superman four yeah. and they did all sorts of other stuff. He had, he got to choose directors. Like there was a whole bunch of things with that, but in the end, they kind of fucked him with this because he wanted to shoot this in New York city, which makes sense given the Fair setting. Enough. And this movie is other than some exterior shots is almost entirely shot in Montreal. Hmm. I did like, it did make me feel like the old, uh, the old, Times Square vibes, though. Very I, I much so. Subway station, yeah. you know. <laughs> the outdoor shots, the outdoor shots of the, where he's on the street, especially when he's in Times Square, like, you grew up here, I grew up here, like, you recognize that. You know that's what it was. Those are legit. Those those feel right, those scenes. Watching the second time is after I knew about the uh, the Montreal, and you realize how much of that is just in nondescript rooms um, that are staged and meant to look like a certain way. And they're shot in Montreal just because to save money. And they use non-union labor. And there were uh, there was protests on the uh, set of the film as a result. So there were a lot of factors that sort of make this a bit odd, even before you really get into the whole thing. This movie exists because they wanted to make Superman for the quest for peace, which if you've seen Superman for the quest for peace, you have to ask, was was this worth it? Mm, mm. Guys, have you guys done that one on this show yet? No. no. Jeff hates superhero movies, so it's not I a do. Good starter. What do you, Jeff? Oh. I do, man. I think that if you're going to sit around and praise cops, you should just put cops in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> what about Watchmen? Never saw it. Hmm. The Watchmen Never saw it or read great. it. I've heard wonderful things. I really should. That one, the that one is was great too. continually brought yeah, up as cool. like a, an the exception book. to my rule. book is amazing. Do you watch movies that are about cops? Do I? Yes. Uh, if Michael Mann directs them. I don't just, uh... Okay. <laughs> cool. uh, i mean if you you can't really avoid all cop I mean, there's so many well like cops as hero movies are different than cop movies. you know what i mean like, yeah yeah i tried like, my best good cop that if it is going to be cop movies it's going to be in your naked gun vein okay so Keystone no, cops no serpico for you i never saw serpico i've never seen it oh wow you were dedicated to this bit okay i really i woke up one day <laughs> After being born and said, Man, this is going to pay off on a podcast later. Okay. No, <laughs> so, no Die Hard. <laughs> oh, now, well, come on. Die Hard is, is amazing. Beverly yeah. Hills Cop. <laughs> so yeah, goes, right? you got me on that, too. But Beverly Hills Cop, comedy. Yeah, that's true. Copland. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned I, I saw Copland in the theater. I don't remember what happens in it. I do remember Method Man looking really cool in it. <laughs> Which what, what is that? Copland. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So not Stallone, Crito. Not the worst movie. No, no. It's, it's pretty good from what I remember. All right. It's no, yeah. it's no cliffhanger, but, you know, that's Stallone for you. But I like that you mentioned Serpico because the director of Street Smart made his bones working with uh, young Al Pacino on The Panic in Eagle Park in 1971. And I then was just Scare- talking about that movie. And then Scarecrow, 1973, which won the Palme d'Or at Con. Whoa. I don't know that movie. So that's uh Pacino and uh Gene Hackman in sort of a an interesting road movie. Yeah, and they that one that won the uh that one yeah. best picture at Con that year. We I, uh, he's doing a, some sort of didn't you say he's doing some sort of thing at uh at one of the movie theaters around here? Yeah, he's gonna be talking yeah. about that movie. So yeah, Gary and I are Shackers talking about if you guys want to join us, we're gonna go just ask him about Street Smart the whole time. <laughs> wait so wait that guy directed street smart? yeah yeah jerry oh. schatzberg who directed street smart did the paddock and Needle park and scarecrow he's doing like a screening of scarecrow at film form he's like 96 years old now and jeff and i are like we should go and just ask him <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good movie dude i hear you but like in street smart <laughs> <laughs> so like you made the choice to have a basketball scene <laughs> mm. why did christopher reeve fuck the hooker why did he fuck? Okay, let's get right into it then. Why oh, did he fuck the hooker? That may not be the correct nomenclature in 2023, just for the record. Fair just enough. Record, Why no. did he procure sex with a sex worker? Um, <laughs> The reason for that seemed obvious. What, what was the confusing part? It just seemed like it didn't have to go there. And he seemed like a, I don't know, like he could have just not fucked her. And so then that the- goes for a lot of men throughout a lot of men's lives no but i'm saying yeah. as far as the plot and 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 what happens in the in the movie it doesn't really change oh as far it. as why it was written in there and the yeah. number 
dead ends that exist in this movie yeah. plot wise they yeah. are numerous and so bizarre every time character development is about to start they kind of just stop it everyone mm. cardboard cut out to a certain extent except morgan freeman is too but he just animates it in a crazy way yeah, he acts his way out of it but even thinking about how the movie starts if morgan freeman as we watched a movie we learned that he's this total sociopath mm. capable of seemingly boundless acts of violence who's feared throughout his neighborhood um and we are talking about what is i guess 1980s new york city yep uh so this is like a very scary person we're led to believe by the end mm -hmm. of the movie who is capable of doing great i mean even at the basketball game he's like everyone's terrified of mm -hmm. what he's going to do which doesn't be fair he grabbed a guy and threatened to kill him because his shot got blocked yes i'd be scared i'd be like okay well this is this is a, yeah, a game that i shouldn't have I want to go play in the Adrian Grenier league. I don't know. What do we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're doing that on a basketball court in like 1987 Harlem, then I presume, you know, mm. you're, 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 you're pretty serious with it. Mm -hmm. Which leads to the question when he walks in on the, uh, on the, on the trick beating the sex worker, mm -hmm. like the guy is beating her up then threatens him, shoves him, is extremely aggressive and naked, by the way, which I was mm -hmm. like, how many men really have the nerve to be this aggressive while naked? You know what I mean? Like, Right. Everything's exposed here. You can yeah, really. It, 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 it seemed crazy to me. Like, I was like, is this guy supposed to be Tony Soprano or something? Where is he, you know, the pimp and his bodyguard burst into the room and you confront them naked, screaming at them after beating her and then threaten to beat them. So that was kind of crazy because Morgan Freeman's character is really trying to placate and back off and not create a problem. When I would think he would have already even like a relatively mild mannered pimp or gangster by that point might have slashed or threatened or beat the dude. But he's like, right. hey, it's OK. Only when the guy continues to get so aggy and threaten him and physically assault him. Does he knee the guy in the balls and kick him? And then dude dies. So at that point, I'm thinking... Do you think it was the face kick or the, the ball knee that started the heart attack? I think it was the yelling that the guy was doing before. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. amount of yelling. He was, in an under, he was in an undue amount of stress there. Yeah, he was very upset about whatever had happened. But I just felt like, okay, you set me up for this... In the beginning, like, okay, this guy is some type of pimp, but not that dangerous, not that bad of a guy. And then by the end, he's willing to, like, kill all witnesses, kill the reporter. Yeah. Send people to kill Christopher Reeve in jail. Everyone mm -hmm. on is scared for him. His own worker who runs around with a gun and a knife is, like, fleeing in terror. So it didn't really, there were lots of points where I felt like what they were doing didn't, like, add up. Like, why would this guy have allowed the John at the beginning to be doing all the things that he was doing? Well, that, yeah, that, that, so that, that's a, it's a very, it's very true. Like, uh, and, and it kind of goes back to the scene with, uh, where, uh, Reeves fucks the prostitute is that, uh, it's like the, these character things, they don't add up at all. And, uh, <laughs> and like, it's as if the movie is written by two different people in two different rooms and, and they kind of just put, like, clunked it together and they're, and they, mm. You know, they they really didn't uh, like at no point am I like, oh, Reeves is a guy who'll cheat on his girl with a prostitute. Sure. He seems like a nice guy. You know, he seems like a guy. Who's, and then you're like, oh, that's and his character is totally now changed. And you're like, oh, he's he's this guy. And with Freeman, it's kind of the same thing. He's like, I was like, oh, he's like a, a gentle pin. And you're like, oh, no, he's a cold blooded murderer. Yeah. Yeah. That see the second one I see the first one I don't quite see. But what I will say is that the him sleeping with her served no purpose narratively. None. Except later for his wife, and nobody's nobody's actions changed. It never happened again. There didn't seem right. to be any logic to it, really. Like it I, became a thing. I, I would say though, they did sort of paint it as Christopher Reeve and his partner were not having sex. 
Oh, okay, yeah. And <clears throat> I might have done yeah, I also think that, you know, people underestimate people a lot of times are like, this is the sort of person who will sleep with the sex worker. And it's really like a broad, broad spectrum of lots and lots and lots of men. Or yeah. it wouldn't be the oldest profession. Yeah, and, and also underestimate that these are pros. You know what I mean? Like, this person was a, a professional, and it was he probably good. Free. He got for free, though, I think. Did, well, he paid for the first day. Oh, did, oh, he did pay for the first Oh, yeah. He but paid for the first day, but that nothing happened. They just, like, this, okay. So, first of all, I want to broach the fact that Christopher Reeve, uh, his character, terrible journalist. He's like a, just a truly awful journalist. I, I was wondering why we didn't just watch Shattered Glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that movie a lot. Yeah. yeah. Just be more entertaining. And then you got um, Stellan Sarsgaard. Is that who was in the movie? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, Hayden Christian said you got Anakin Skywalker in that business, too. Okay. All right. Yeah. Are, there would be a few reasons. Speaking as a former vice journalist, thanks, Blockhead. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at freelance, freelance. I was never on staff. Um, oh, like a vice article, right? No, it's like a vice. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's just like I learned a lot more watching this a second time. I think that there are clues from the very beginning scenes of this film that Christopher Reeves is not a good guy and that he's not a good person. He's not a good, he's not good at his job and he's not mm -hmm. necessarily a good human being. And, you know, I, I think the film uses moralist moments like. The, like the scene with Punchy in the motel is to be like, now now you judgy 1980s film viewer, now you're like, this is when he's a bad person. But actually, you really can see him much earlier sort of just being this kind of self-serving, self-centered person, um, real privilege situation, the Harvard degree being mentioned a few times. And you sort of get to this, like, he's wants to do this sort of fantasy thing where he gets to play in these quote unquote dangerous spaces. And, you know, it reminds me, it's been done a lot better. If you look at Blue Velvet, for example, Kyle MacLachlan's character, you know, just starts to, you know, he goes from a straight from a seemingly straight safe life to engaging with um, characters who exist in subculture. And gets himself mm -hmm. in all matter of trouble there. And this is a version of that, only this is more complicated because of the the convoluted nature of this plot. But I think to to the to the credit of of the filmmakers that they don't completely obfuscate the fact that Chris Reeves is not a good person. But I think seeing him in three Superman movies prior to this would have given a lot of movie going audiences the impression that he was the protagonist or hero of the story and he ain't no such thing well two things i will say he pays no price for the things that happen and to some extent occupies is a you know i guess maybe the moral center of the movie is kind of punchy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after her death and the attack upon his wife, he's allowed to take on a role that essentially makes him kind of a hero of sorts. He faces in the end no real censure or repercussions for what happened. He's the big winner in all of this, despite jail and having yeah, to admit that he made a story up and all that. Career for not having the notes he doesn't yeah i don't know it's weird i don't know what they were trying to do man i don't know i don't know what they were trying to do it's badly yeah. it's badly it's like not the worst idea very badly written and put together um Punchy's death yeah. since it's been broached yeah um <clears throat> we get a lot of punchy in the movie and then punchy's death is yeah. Uh, for lack of better terms, a dove, yes, being released dove. into a night sky. <laughs> That's they it. Really do that. That's all. He, Morgan Freeman standing outside of a building that he knows where she is, which is crazy enough. Yeah, and is like confronts her very quickly with a line, and then a dove is released, and then we're back in jail, and the guy's like, "Punchy's dead." I do think that the. I do think that. 
the decision not to show her being murdered or whatever at that point. We don't need that. And I also think that Fair. Morgan Freeman unfolding from behind that column was oh. one of the few moments in the movie where I was genuinely surprised. Mm. A little bit chilling yeah. of a moment. His violence toward his employees were the were the most chilling moments, obviously. He and Punchy's eye scene was shocking. I mean, that's the Oscar moment there. That's that's yeah. the that's where the nomination has to come in, is just seeing that. Yeah. I, I, to, to go back to the ending just for a sec, um, with that, I think I would have enjoyed this film about 25% more if it had ended before if it ended about eight minutes sooner. If we mm. had not gotten to this sort of I really dislike the ending of this film because I think it does exactly what you're saying, Woods, is it it, it doesn't it doesn't really resolve, it doesn't make it feel good, it makes it seem like he's he comes out of this unscathed like even though there's this threat that he's going to be charged with evidence tampering at some point like they don't show anything about that he's the guy on tv still he's still able to do tv news or whatever in that last yeah season. and they also didn't it didn't have a feeling of like i don't know nightcrawler where it's like mm. the bad guy got away with it all mm -hmm. or anything like that it was just kind of like the bad guy was morgan freeman he got taken out yeah, I feel like there would have been more of a statement of this film and the type of film I think they were trying to do if it didn't have this sort of Hollywoodish ending to it. Like, and all not for nothing. Like, we're talking about character development, but just like Christopher Reeve at no point reveals himself to be any sort of savvy, any sort of kind of person who could scheme up a plot like that in the end. Oh, oh hold on, and then how is it that Christopher Reeve gets the guy's henchman in the car? And all of a Ow. sudden, he puts him in like a one third of a half Nelson, and dude is like, oh, he's a tough guy. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah. And that dude's like fleeing <laughs> terror, and the whole time he's seen this dude with knives and guns stabbed a white woman in broad daylight at a market. Yep. He's and not. He's like the reporter has his hands on me. I've got to run. He can't even throw hands with the journalist to get this videotape. Like now, we're okay. really taking a beating in this conversation, and and and, and fair enough. I, I noted that Reeves was never shook at any point, and like in all the situations he was in, he seemed very comfortable. Like when he when he went to the to Fast Black's house, he was like almost too comfortable, like rudely so. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, it was interesting to me that he was just un like or or the scene in the uh the at the the party where he brings Morgan Freeman and and mm -hmm. Munchy, where he's just like. Like not even like he has no sense of anything else is going on around. Like like he's like making out with the with with Punchy, with his girl. Yeah, right, <laughs> right there. But she's right there with his yeah. boss. He, he, he's he's very emboldened the entire movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean he he definitely was feeling himself. I would say the only time is when uh, Morgan Freeman, and that's when I started to be like, what? Like when Morgan Freeman uh, threatened the woman with the broken bottle who is mm -hmm. giving money. And then oh, he yeah. tried to be like, okay, calm down now. White man is here. And then Morgan Freeman like put the glass broken bottle to his face. And I was like, that's kind of crazy. But also, it's like, isn't homie on bail for uh murder too? Now he's just gonna be slashing up reporters that are on TV news. Like, how there were a lot of things where I was like. I guess maybe he's supposed to be that crazy. Fast Black's decision-making process was unhinged. It seemed like the things that should set him off the most had no effect. And then the smallest things, like they left a party and people were happy having had been to a party. And he was like, you guys are idiots. Fuck you guys. I never want to see anybody ever again. How dare you act like you had fun at this party? I could relate to that part though. <laughs> no, I felt like that was honestly that was I honestly felt like that was kind of a good scene because he he had an awareness there of what Christopher Reeve was doing. Chris, Christopher Reeve, even Christopher Reeve's wife was like, "You sure you want to do this?" And he's like, "Yeah," because it's like he's so comfortable in this lie and he's so feeling himself and so full of like. I'm a six five all American guy. Mm -hmm. He's actually just 
Like I'm gonna bring this street dude pimp who's on charge for attempt murder to this like super waspy holiday party or something for my job. Yeah. Can we figure out what magazine he works for? The New York Journal. New York Journal. Okay. Well, d- didn't but but wasn't part of that. And now he's on TV too. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, and I'm gonna to bring this. I'm gonna bring this uh, this this sex worker who works for him there too. And who I have had sex with at this juncture. And I'm going to kind of revel in. Speaking of vice, I'm going to kind of <laughs> revel in this dichotomy and being at the center of it and being the person who's like, oh, I brought these people into this milieu and I'm just like totally comfortable with it or whatever. Um, and uh, I don't know. I got, I, I guess I got the feeling that uh, Christopher Reeve's character in this was, he was definitely at that point, I felt like he was just felt like he could pretty much just do whatever he wanted. Yeah. I also bit- f- well, he I did. He wrote one article, and he got yeah. offered a TV gig. Yeah, but I, I yeah, and he. So got that's that's got to feel pretty meteoric. Oh man, you but know that's also to writing, right? That is that how that works? When you write one big article, and then all of a sudden you get a, <laughs> it's not working. I can't. I I personally have turned down so many TV jobs at this point. I don't know what to do with them. It's like stop calling. I haven't written in years. Stop calling me. I they have Apple TV. Know. I pay for it. Wait, I, I have a gripe with a, a major part of the plot, though. Um, okay. The uh, it's like you know the whole thing what happens where, where where they they they're like who are you talking about what who is this pimp you're talking about and the lawyer's like it's him and I don't know what they're basing that on I mean I obviously they have but like if Peter I mean if uh, Christopher Reeves like no it's not this movie doesn't exist <laughs> this movie doesn't happen <laughs> it's, like, it's not him and he's like yeah it is he's like but it's not. And there you go. And that's the- oh, he does do that, but it, not not in that, but, but, but later. later. We can't understand. Everyone, the the prosecutor is convinced that it's him, and it's so weird because it's like, surely there's, as Christopher Reeve attempts to point out, there's lots of pimps. Yeah, and we don't. Friends. We're never even. We're never even shown what exactly the prosecutor. What hole in the case is there? Right. And it, oh, that's my favorite is the prosecutor's like, my case isn't bad, but it would be a lot better if you came along. If you would just work, this. he was well cast, that prosecutor. He's yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's also like it's it's the evidence is there's such circumstantial stuff of like he thinks that the article is about fast black, the Tyrone Sheik of the Streets, the name of the article, mm-hmm, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um the <laughs> the the idea is that. There's a restaurant in described in there's a restaurant described in the article um that the DA, the ADA, I should say, identifies himself as oh, that's Louise's. They're like, okay, so you recognized a, a, a location. And that to him is enough to prove it because apparently and orange fast juice black, for you who yeah fast black yeah, fast black hat is out there all the time. So it's like, yeah, you know, this is there's that. But like I think I think Buck, and I think you're absolutely right to call that particular bit out because it is the it is uh, uh, it's a heavy twig that that's really la- trying to lay. Like, yeah, to be yeah, that would, but the, I would never find like he would never get in trouble for that. For no, because- I think the the main point is that there's no real. What you're pointing out is there's no real reason other than like, okay, so you think it's it's like that's not a, there's not a lot of compelling evidence that it is this guy. And then not only that, what is Christopher Reeves? What 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 do, what is his what is this his story has nothing to do with that. Right. Like, presumably, you have this guy. He's fingerprints. He's in the room. He assaulted the guy. His lawyer is trying to plead out. It was even bananas to me to the extent um, to which he. I mean, maybe he just really wanted. Again, there's so much that we're missing here. Does he right. have yeah yeah you yeah. that's fast black? Because otherwise, it's like, why are you so concerned? What did you just like, bro? Is that? Oh, it's a, oh, this is a. <laughs> This is a, uh, this is, it's, 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 a, it's got, it's like a hash hole situation. It's, it's, uh, it's about to be a lot of fun for me. Yeah. I saw the way it lit up right there. That was, uh, that was very serious. It was cinematic. It's more cinematic than a lot of this film. <laughs> Agree. 
Yeah. At what point in the movie did you realize Reeves' character was a piece of shit? Like just a total piece of shit. At what point really was it for you? It was plainly obvious when his wife was like, yo, what if I came with you kind of jokingly? And he was like, that would be great. That's I would I really love for to you to, to come to a dangerous part of town and hang out looking good as hell around some dangerous folks. Pretending to be, et cetera. Yeah, that was really, that was really bizarre. Although I didn't know if that was just naivete because he also, I mean, this is a guy who literally went out. He's supposed to be a journalist. Although again, Stephen Glass does exist. So yes, he exists. He's supposed to be a journalist. And he goes out and he's like, hey, can I talk to you? And the guy's like, get the fuck out of here. The pip that he tries to talk to. <laughs> right. He talks to one other person and then he gives up. Yeah. He's a terrible journalist. He yeah. does finally get someone to talk to him for, or at least like hang out with him for a second, even though he's paying for it. Um, one, do you think that was expensive? Do you he think he could put $60 in? He could have pivoted to a new story about her. My main point Anything. is how it's like he's a reprehensible person, to be honest, uh, was uh, the fake story. And then the fact that the fake story involved a black pip named Tyrone who had a condo in Hawaii. Right. Yes. That seemed to be covering a lot of bases of both racist, obvious, uh, totally unethical to be making up the story anyway. And then also, why did you have to go? It's always crazy to me when people make up, you know, like with Trump sometimes you'd be like, why are you going? Like, it's not just a lie. It has to be, like, the most absurd lie of all right. that, you know, for... Right, for... That, this, that this pimp is still doing this thing, even though he can afford a condo in Hawaii. What what happened? What, yeah, that, the whole... And why would you write that? It yeah. just seems like something that somebody could easily prove wrong or that would stand out as ridiculous. So at that point, I was like, I do not like this guy. Um, and I right. think when his wife started to not like him also. I I I realized that Mimi Rogers isn't Andy McDowell. Oh, okay, oh, sure. <laughs> I was watching. I was like, I was like, oh, huh? That's not Andy McDowell. <laughs> it's not um, to- the things think, we learn I, on Tubi. I think I I think that I realized during the. I mean, maybe I was late to the game because I you know I got I have trouble paying attention to some things sometimes, <laughs> and uh and uh I think I realized in the scene when he had sex with the with the prostitute, but like that's when I was like, oh, that's a it seemed like a leap to me, but you guys are clearly noticing things that I was just kind of oblivious to because I was, I, I might have been <laughs> no. looking at my phone for a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm just bringing it up because I feel like I I learned more again on the second viewing. I got this. I got to see more about it, but I sort of wanted it to be an avenue into some of these moments that have just been described because I feel like there's a lot of stuff. So that way, like you as you see this, I think the earliest presentation of Morgan Freeman's Fast Black, which we talked about before, it. You don't see him for the sociopath he is only, say, 20 more minutes into the film. But in those early scenes, it almost seems like, wait, maybe I'm supposed to be rooting for Morgan Freeman. Maybe actually. Well, the, this the is- first scene is him in a car with his cohort, his his muscle. And his muscle yeah. is like, man, did you see the fight? And he's like, shut up. I hate you. <laughs> like, yeah. why are you speaking to me in this car when we're together? It's really. And then he's, but then he flips. And then and he's like, he flips it and saves the sex worker's life. And you're like, okay, so this is a flawed hero. And then he also the rest flips. of the time, they're like, I oh, just want to make sure that anything good he did is completely taken off the table. Well, the, the basketball yeah. scene is, is where I was like, oh, he's a maniac. He's yeah. an actual maniac. But also, right? yeah. the scene in the car where, where he's uh, he's making out with his prostitute. With mm-hmm. Reeves sitting right there was really uncomfortable and it was a very uncomfortable really scene. evil and very evil. Like that scene was a lot to well, that, that yeah. one made me feel like, oh god. And it, it almost like the the to go back to what Woods was saying, kind of where I wanted to get to is that it's really after the article is published when we start to actually have more interactions with with Fast Black with Morgan Green's character is where we start to see more stereotypical and almost caricaturized violence from this character Hmm. that he's from and i think that it's i don't think this was intentional because i think we're still dealing with people who probably in terms of the uh the writer and director of this film probably didn't have much experience in this particular uh you know 
I don't think they had a particular experience in, in this area that they were writing about I, or making a film about. I think what ends up happening is the film itself calls Reeves out for being racist from, of all people, the black anchor woman. Um, mm-hmm. the TV news who when if you'll if you recall again I saw this really in the second viewing when they first meet in the restaurant and she's and she's with the white producer at the TV station mm-hmm. he basically doesn't acknowledge her he pretty much ignores her and later on when she calls him out for racism on live television it's it's a real moment and it, and it actually had some some weight and some meaning but unfortunately it is in the you know in the this film's need to villainize the villain which in some way to not justify reese's behavior but to sort of make him into a quote-unquote flawed protagonist mm. like all that all that happens it's a it's a moment of real clarity that happens in the film that then is immediate that is appreciated in retrospect, but unfortunately is stuck in this idea. Yeah, buried, that it gets buried under the like. Look at, the, look at the horrible. Look at the horrible things this pimp is going to do. Right, and the uh, you know we end up getting the DA's version of Morgan Freeman more than the reporter's version of Morgan Freeman in the film. I guess assistant DA. My apologies. Right, yeah, assistant GA. Let's let's not give him all that credit. <laughs> you know, you know what uh Reeves reminded me of uh of the guy in season five of The Wire. The oh. guy was uh, like that liar and that like he had seen similar, but he was like a tall, handsome version of him. He's like like you know, a weaselly kind of you know, just liar. <laughs> so <a> weaselly liar. <laughs> I think yeah. it would have been cooler to have someone who wasn't Superman in that role. Yeah, like 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 Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> I think Perfect. you could have yeah. I think you, you could have put somebody like that in, in that role. You could have put uh I think Pacino at that mm-hmm. point. I mean unfortunately Pacino at that point it's a little later. He's doing like Sea of Love around that time. It's Bro, the writing. Movie. The writing, dude. No one's yeah. escaped from the way this it's, it's yeah. written and conceived. A side thing I want to say, I don't know actually. Let me let you guys finish what you were talking about. I'm- <laughs> Oh no, we're 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 ready. We're ready for uh, yeah, another, me. <laughs> from, from another perspective. Uh, Let's go. Crazy thing is, uh, Kathy Baker still looks the same, but yes. also was Wait, who's that? really cute. Punchy. Oh, punchy. punchy. Okay. She was really cute. Agree. But it's, then I was also yeah. like, this woman still looks the same now. Yes. And she has also done so many things, but this must be the earliest thing that I can remember her doing. In fact, let me. Look. Yeah, she started. She was doing TV. She did TV a couple of years after this, and had she was on. She was on. She was on like one of these like dramedies, I believe, if I remember correctly. She, she like, looks very familiar to me, but I, I can't place a, the thing that she's in. You've just seen her in so many things. Yeah, she's a character. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, 1987. The, Street Smart is seemingly her second film role she was in the right stuff mm-hmm. and then uh edward which... scissorhands if i remember correctly am i crazy that's later yeah, though that's way later, later. Though. this that's is night street smarts is 1987 yeah yes um the right stuff is 1983 83 yeah, so uh, this is very early in her career, but um, good for Speaking, her. Speaking, yeah, another person who always looks like themselves, Anna Maria Harsford, who plays uh, Harriet, uh, who was the the matriarch of Fast Blacks. Uh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, yeah. AKA Craig's, Craig's mom, mom. Friday, yeah. Craig's mom, yeah. <laughs> and also, she was on. Uh, I think she was on TV at that time. I think. I think she was. In all kinds of things, but like this was like in the midst of one of those like big, big sitcom runs for her. It's uh, Anna Maria Hauser. It was Amen, right? Amen. That's right. Mm, yeah, good, good call on that. I totally did not, um, did not recognize her. Yeah, it was the first season. The she was. Movie. She had. By the time this movie came out, the first season of Amen had already aired. So it's interesting to see that. Obviously, she's on. I think there's a lot of 
the, between like Reeves and her character and, and maybe a handful of others, like there were some people who you knew them from other things. You saw them in other things and now they were in a very different you, context. You can see them you being, think, you can see her being unrecognizable. Do you think the entire run of Amen, she got told to shut up more than the two scenes she was in in the film? <laughs> I doubt it. Wow. She has to shut up a lot in this. That's true. It's pretty much every time she opens her mouth, Morgan Freeman's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut up. Like, damn, dude. Oh. Um, yeah, he really, he really, and I mean, I can see how some of these things would have worked if it had been properly written. Like, you could see how mm-hmm. Morgan Freeman becomes more desperate as he's facing this case against him and becomes more extreme because i even felt like his first interaction with her they were kind of both giving each other the business yeah and then the second one he's like unhinged and she's obviously terrified that he's actually going to stab this woman's eye out or something crazy sure yeah Uh, but yeah there's a a framework for a good movie here it just everything in the inside is 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 a problem a little bit you know yeah unlike unlike the other films we've subjected you guys to (laughs) there's a framework of a good movie here there's an actual good movie yeah i'm not coming back again unless it's caveman's valentine man (laughs) i think that's fair i think you've just you've just sealed your fate and it's a (laughs) you have we and should do fine. we should do the arm and hammer. We should get a lucid on and watch this. I just want somebody else. I truly believe that I'm the only other person, me and two other people I watched it with are the only people who watched Caveman's Valentine. As Mine I is said, scary. As, as I said on our episode for Marcy X, oh, yes, I saw see. Caveman's Valentine at the Virgin Mega in Store the the Square in the theater. Hold on, how? Midnight screening. It was like a midnight screening of it. It was like 11.30, maybe 12 o'clock. It was at, playing at the Virgin Mega Store for like one weekend, I guess. <laughs> and I saw oh, it. I, I made money. Like a ironic? Why did you do that? No, I just was, saw there was a movie and I was like, oh, yeah, I haven't heard about this. I'll go check it out. And I had, did not, I had no expectations because I had no idea what it was. Yeah. I've still never seen it. I, we've talked about it more than I have any desire to see it. Okay, yeah. Well, so yeah, do it. Let's do it. We'll get it going. A midnight screening too, because I swear that movie is like two and a half hours or something. I oh. worked out very. I was very sleepy. I remember it being very late. Getting back on the subway uh, and heading home, <laughs> heading back to Queens. It was a rough one that night. Then you had to go to Queens too. Wow. Yes, sir. It's... I had to go, let's go right back over to Queens. <laughs> the story keeps getting worse. To hop on. The uh... I remember. I remember being fucking tired. Can we talk about one of the good things right. in this film? Like one of the few yeah. actually good things in this film. And that's uh, Miles Davis. Correct. Miles Davis did the soundtrack to this film. So I was going to say, there's, there's some samples at the end. I was like, hmm. like they, they, want, they sound like ca samples. There's a couple little loops. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> take these. I would take these. <laughs> so this is during the 80s when Miles Davis was working very closely with Robert Irving III. Um, they worked on decoy you're under arrest and basically uh robert was working with miles davis through 89 so close to the last few years of of, of davis's life and when i saw this come across the screen that miles davis had contributed to the soundtrack i thought that just at the very beginning and the opening cards I'm like well this is exciting this is going to be really good and every time i hear their score in the film it sounds great it actually makes this film seem better. Mm. There's, it's not my favorite use of music in the in this film, but it is something that does sort of add some gravity to a film that maybe doesn't deserve it, given the flaws we've all been pointing out. Did, did you Which, notice? I'm sorry to interrupt, but but in speaking of music, uh, again, going back to the scene where he has sex with a prostitute, which is, that, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's my know, favorite. That's my favorite. Yes, the music no. got really loud, and they just have it, it it becomes like a weird they're just talking like they're just you can't hear what they're saying and the music's just playing really loud over it they're, they're talking over it. they're talking really loud over carol king's you make me feel like a natural woman and We're i just like uh, where not, was the music coming from where was the music coming from for the first and time? it was inappropriate for that see like they weren't gonna be in love there was no it was just like you paid for your time we may as well we didn't know that at the time especially since Fair. It, it did seem like a spontaneous. He certainly hadn't paid for them. It, it yeah, it, it had a it had a, it had a level of spontaneity to it. Like, oh, they were just sitting there vibing, and an attraction took over. 
was the way it was painted. So yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like kind of cool sound editing at the time. No, weird well, choice. The fact like that they, they, yeah, loud. <laughs> The loudness was was jarring. Where all of a sudden now the music's full blast and we can't hear them talk. But she's well, still telling the story. The, I thought that was the point. Was that uh, they're just the vibes know. have taken over. Yeah, like sometimes you you know before you're gonna hook up with somebody, you really start to feel the vibe, and words are just come, still coming out of your mouth, but you're no longer even sure what you're talking about. And the Venga Boys soundtrack just gets louder and louder. Is no, <laughs> it's just Darude Sandstorm escalating. Yeah, I would, I would, if they had used that song, I would have given this an A plus. Oh yeah, yeah. that song existed back then. It'd be great. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. This is pre Crazy Frog, so like, there's a who lot of great needs, we could have had. Who needs Miles Davis when you have Darude and Crazy Frog? <laughs> <sighs> All right, guys. But fun fact: There's a new Crazy Frog <laughs> song. In case you needed to know, that's not a fun fact. No, that's really. it's a fun fact. There is. We we've somebody's been trying to sell it at my no. work for so long. That's so bad. They're like, "There's a new Crazy Frog." I'm like, "Please, no more with the Crazy Frog." The Cabbages Podcast Network.